Barbing barbu. I think it's normal to think back on your cringy moments, maybe like back in middle school, high school. When you're 12, you're trying to impress the guy that you like, but you end up doing some very questionable things. It's cringy. It's endearing. It's very normal. Jane was having one of those moments. She remembered when she was in the seventh grade, she's 12, she's got the biggest, fattest crush on this guy named Robert. She met him when she joined this, um, do you guys know the Police Explorers program? It's a big group of kids from the community. They get to hang out and learn from police officers. They get to work with police dogs, learn how to do CPR. They get to learn about the harm that drugs do to you. And once Jane meets Robert in this program, she's head over heels for him. She would always try to see him at the gym, try to get him to look her way. But when she's 12, she genuinely thought that he is the coolest, coolest person alive. He was like the love of her life, really. But there was so much competition. Literally, all the girls in the group are fighting for Robert's attention. One of them even came up to her at McDonald's. Jane is 12. This girl that comes up to her is 13, so the grade above her. And she tells her, stop talking to Robert. Leave him alone. Don't let me find out that you're talking to him. It's like Robert is a girl magnet in almost this jock kind of way. Girls were always fighting for his attention. And one day, Jane can't take it anymore. She sits down and she writes this love letter of sorts, just professing her feelings for him, confessing how beautiful she thought he was. She wrote in depth about her feelings, about how he makes her feel. It was just this really long letter full of romantic sentiments and probably dotted all over the place with hearts, like the way a 12-year-old would write a love letter. And the next time they're at the gym, she walks straight up to him and delivers the letter. He doesn't read it in front of her, but he does give her a hug, which is a good sign, right? Nothing really comes out of the letter, at least not initially. Robert, her crush, would still initiate these moments where he would come up to her and hug her, which is good, but it's also kind of annoying because he did this with every single girl in the program. He was a bit of a flirt. But other than that, he never really mentioned the letter ever again. A few months later, Jane is devastated to learn that Robert is now in a relationship with another girl. She's distraught. She shows up to the gym, bawling her eyes out. I mean, bloodshot eyes, snot down her chin, can't catch her breath. That level of bawling. She throws herself on another boy and just like cuddles into his arms, crying about what's going on. And everyone in that gym knew that something was about to happen because she was obsessed with Robert. This was not even just a regular crush. This was the world's biggest fascination, infatuation with him. When Robert finds out about Jane's reaction, he asks her, hey, can we get a moment to talk? He tries to find a quiet little place and together they walk into the gym teacher's office and it's empty. So they close the door behind them And Robert walks up to Jane, gets closer and closer, picks her up by the waist and lifts her slowly onto the gym teacher's desk. He's staring directly into her eyes and he kisses her on the forehead, gives her a nice tight hug and says, you're a total knockout and I'm definitely going to take you on a date when you turn 18. Jane smiled. Officer Robert Devine the head of the police explorers program thought she, a 12-year-old, was a total knockout. How old is he? Late 20s. As an adult, Jane still cringes when she thinks back to this time. I mean, she always thought it was very strange that Officer Robert never really turned her down and that he would allegedly joke about finding 13-year-old girls when they turn 18 so that they could have sexual relations. This is a memory that she tried to forget as she got older. It just felt so cringe. It felt so gross, especially now that she has a 12-year-old daughter herself. But it is a memory that she would have to call the police department about when she hears that her childhood crush, Officer Robert, is somehow linked to the mysterious death of a local pregnant woman. Why would the town think that a police officer was involved in a young pregnant woman's death? This question would blow open the lid to a world of some really, really dark allegations. Allegations that multiple married police officers had intimate relations with a young, vulnerable woman. Allegations that some of these inappropriate relationships started while the officers were adults and she was just 14 years old. And allegations that one of these cops had gotten her pregnant. And that would ultimately lead to the biggest speculation of them all. Did one of them want to kill her to keep her quiet?
We would like to thank today's sponsors who have made it possible for Rotten Mango to support NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. This is the nation's largest grassroots mental health nonprofit that is dedicated to building better lives for millions of Americans. This episode's partnerships have also made it possible to support Rotten Mango's growing team of dedicated researchers, translators, while they focus on shedding light on stories from all over the world. And we would also like to thank you guys for your continued support as we work on our mission to be worthy advocates for these causes. And of course, as always, full show notes are available at RottenMangoPodcast.com. Now, there is a really good podcast on this case called The Case. They did an absolute deep dive in this. I mean, they did a lot of incredible work over there. This case is not the most well-known case out there, and it was certainly not talked about enough, especially when they started doing their investigations. So this podcast, they had conversations with anonymous sources who knew the parties involved that we're talking about today. They went to the apartment building where the disease was found, they really put in their whole all into getting this case out into the open, out into the public, and getting it talked about. So please go and listen and support The Case. That's the podcast name. And I would also recommend checking out Justice for Sandra Birchmore on Facebook. It is a page run by Melissa Berry, and the members are focused on spreading awareness on this. So with that being said, this is a case that's going to come with some hefty disclaimers. So please keep these in mind throughout the entirety of the episode. Nobody has been formally investigated or charged of murder in this case. All discourse surrounding foul play is purely just based off of suspicion. Any theories that I talk about today are just that. They're just theories, at least as of right now. They are theories that have been circulating amongst netizens and not in the court of law or even by prosecutors. This is all speculation. All the information in this video is available online and to the public as well. And technically, this case has no real suspects because again, There is no real investigation into Sandra's death, but I do personally think that there should be. Again, I'm not insinuating that someone or multiple people are guilty. I just think that they can open an investigation. Hmm. I think personally, there are enough questions that feel unanswered surrounding her death that should be looked into. And that's a personal opinion. And quick disclaimer, when I mentioned someone today being questioned or interviewed, can you guys tell I'm like kind of freaked out? There's a lot of cops in this story. So quick disclaimer, when I mentioned someone today being interviewed or questioned, I'm using that word by definition of someone is asking someone questions and interviewing them. But for legal purposes, nobody in this case is legally considered a suspect and they are not being interrogated. Everyone we talk about, even if they are being interviewed or questioned, are just considered witnesses. And there might be times where I refer to a relationship between two people as a, quote, inappropriate relationship, but it would be in a lot of people's personal opinions that a better fitting word would be abuse, our word, grooming. But for legal reasons, I will be calling it inappropriate relationship, even if I have differing personal opinions about certain situations. So with that being said, let's get into it. In 2014, dozens of Stoughton police officers get a notification pop up on their phone. Some of them are on shift. They're pulling their phone out of their pocket of their uniform. Others are resting at home with their families when their phone dings. Some are patrolling around in their police vehicles with like suspects in the back. It's a Facebook message from a name that they're all familiar with. Depending on each person's ranking, it's either their coworker or their boss. So they all know who this guy is that's messaging them. It's Robert Devine, Officer Robert Devine of the Stoughton Police Department. Thank you for contributing to a healthy Stoughton, and we applaud your efforts. That's weird. Why would he be mass messaging the officers at the station? They click open the message, and there is just a string of explicit pictures of Officer Robert Devine having relations with a woman that is not his wife. His wife, Lisa Devine, also happens to be a police officer in the next town over. So everybody knows this married couple of cops, but that's not his wife in the pictures. The police officers, they feel like they're looking at something illegal. Did he mean to send us his pictures? Because the account is from someone named Robert Devine. So is that Robert Devine sending us the pics? Did he accidentally mean to send it to his just his mistress, but instead selected all of his colleagues and all of his colleagues' wives instead? Because some of the other officers' wives, who aren't even in the police department, they received the notification. So what the hell is going on? The next time Robert Devine walks into the station, I wouldn't be surprised if everyone was staring at him weird. He gets called into the police chief's office where he had a, let me explain, it's not what it looks like moment. According to Robert, he met a woman named Tiffany. 
They started engaging in intimate relations just a few times, you know, just like once or twice. But by that summer, the flowers had bloomed, the rain and snow were gone, and he woke up and he's like, you know what? I'm a married man. I probably shouldn't be having an affair. But of course, the mistress is crazy. She's insane. She's territorial. She's not having it. She was sending me messages threatening to exit her own life if I didn't stay with her. And I guess as an act of desperation, she sent explicit photos to all of the coworkers. Maybe she realized that he was going to break up with her regardless of what she said. So he should at least have to face the music too and not try to hide the fact that they had scandalous relations. Now, this is all Robert's side of the story. He said Tiffany was just absolutely obsessed with him. She is an unhinged mistress who can't get over the fact that he's just not that into her. And because having an affair isn't necessarily illegal, and I guess the police did not see it as like a fireable offense to send explicit photos to coworkers, Officer Roberts' 2014, quote, scandal, if you will, turned more into a moral dilemma of sorts. We don't really have Tiffany's side of the story, but her friend stated, this ruined her life. She lost her job, she had to move, she changed her name legally and had to get away from it all. She's not the girl that she once was. He preyed on a vulnerable woman and then completely decimated her life. He is the worst kind of person. He knew the power that he had and he played her. He got caught and then he blamed everything on her, making her out to be this unhinged mistress that she's not. Wait, so who sent the photos? We don't know. Robbers said that it was her, mm -hmm. Tiffany, who sent the photo. Hacked into his account and sent all the photos. Could but Tiffany's life was ruined because her explicit photos are out there now and yes. people are talking about it. And so she, ha she okay. And, hmm. you know, how do you really live in a town when all the cops in that town hate your guts? That's a very dangerous situation to be in, I would imagine. So from Tiffany's side, she's basically, it seems like she's saying Robert used his power as a cop, had an affair with her, and it was his word over hers. Made her into the crazy mistress to the point where she had to change her life. But Robert Devine would just say, no, she was just obsessed with me. Seven years later, he would claim another woman was just obsessed with him. But she would end up dead. Have you ever been stuck in like a category three snow blizzard? A snowstorm? It's really bad. So typically in category three blizzards, you're looking at close to two feet of snow accumulated on the ground, wind speeds of over 100 miles per hour. Schools will typically be shut down. It's advised that people have enough water, gas, and backup power to last three days. If you absolutely must go out, it's encouraged that you stuff giant bags of sand into the trunk of your car because most cars are front heavy. So if you're spinning around in the snow because the ground is frozen, you need to have some weight mm. in the back. And in the worst case scenario, if you are driving and you fall into a ditch in your car, they tell you to have a large flashlight on the ready to signal for help. And that weekend in Massachusetts and New York, there was a category three blizzard. It was unofficially named the Winter Storm Orlena, and it caused close to $1.9 billion in damage. When was this? January 31st to February 4th, 2021. So in Canton, Massachusetts, this is like a 40 minute drive from Boston. The storm was taken very, very seriously. You're talking about Massachusetts. These people know what they're doing when it comes to snow. Six people ended up passing away from that blizzard. And Thursday, February 4th, 2021, it was like the day after the blizzard. The sun is back up and it feels like things are going to start kicking back into normal. Police get a phone call. A 23-year-old teacher's assistant failed to show up to work. Her colleagues at the school, they're starting to get a little worried. I mean, for a few reasons. So before the snowstorm, this woman, Sandra, had told a colleague in the school hallway that if something were to happen to her, her boyfriend would be responsible. And now she's not at work. So yeah, maybe they're getting a little paranoid. Maybe they're overthinking. Maybe it's just she snowed in from the blizzard or she's late. Either way, they requested a wellness check on 23-year-old Sandra Birchmore. Three officers get dispatched to her apartment building right after the blizzard. And they start knocking on her unit's door. No response. Okay, maybe she's not home. Maybe she was on her way to work. She was driving, got lost, got onto a frozen piece of a stretch of road, fell into a ditch. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe she could have stayed with a friend during the snowstorm. Just to be certain, though, they go out into the apartment building's parking lot, which is outside, and one car is sticking out like a sore thumb. There's just one vehicle in the entire lot that has what looks like a brick wall of snow surrounding it. Like it's, it's cubed in snow. The other cars, they had some snow, but not nearly as much. 
This car looked like it had been sitting there, unmoving since the start of the blizzard, and all of the blizzard had just accumulated on mm-hmm. this car. And that's been, what, days? How many days? Yeah, days. The wellness check got a lot more serious once they verified that was Sandra's car. Because that means she's probably still in the apartment. If she went somewhere in the middle of the snowstorm, she would have taken her car, right? Like, nobody in their right mind just walks out of their apartment into a blizzard. Following that logic, if she did not take her car, she did not leave her apartment, and the only reason she's not answering the door right now and not showing up to work is... Because the police call for the property manager to ask her to let them into the unit. The minute that Sandra's door was unlocked, three things just smacked the three officers in the face. One, Sandra's two cats were meowing really loudly when they opened the door. Two, you know how when you walk by a neighbor's place, they open their door and you get a whiff. You can almost smell what they smell like. Every house, every unit has a different scent and it's odd. It's not necessarily bad or good. Sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's this. And the the physical act of opening the door just pushes the scent out straight into your nostrils. Well, the scent coming from this unit was strong and it wasn't good. And three, the apartment is not big. So the minute that the door swings open, the officers get a good look into the place. The entire kitchen and hallway looked like the winter storm had been inside. It was a disaster. Every centimeter of the kitchen counter was covered in something. Old letters, junk mail, medication, trash. They step into the living room. The carpet's got balls of fur that's like rolling around like tumbleweeds. Debris, trash covering practically every single surface, including the floor, the couch. There's boxes of stuff that look like it's just been emptied, dumped onto the couch. Which is interesting because it's not really giving a typical hoarder situation. Maybe Sandra was looking for something. Sandra, are you there? We're with the Stoughton Police Department for a wellness check. The officers open the nearest door to them and they step into the restroom. Everything in there is very neat and organized. Very interesting. It's a contrast. So it's a question of, is she just messy or did something happen? But if she's just messy, she just has a thing for her bathroom. She likes to keep it clean. Then they turned and they see another door. This door was slightly closed. It was open a crack. There was this strange glow coming from the crack of the door, almost like coming out of the room, like a colorful Christmas glow. You know those rainbow string lights? It's like that weird orangish bluish tint. That, that was glowing from under the door and it's February. They push open the door and the entire room is just like outside. Bags, paper, even a necklace just on the floor. The bed is unmade, empty bags everywhere. The window has colorful Christmas lights strung up around it, festive. And in the middle of the floor is Sandra. Her feet are pointing towards the door, so the officers would have likely faced her when they walked in. She had a scarf tied around her neck, and it was attached to the closet doorknob. So she's sitting, remember the Sherman case? Very similar to the Sherman case. Around her mouth, there was dried blood. At least from just looking at her, it was stated that there were no physical signs of abuse, no markings on her body, no indication of being struck or defensive wounds or even bruising or swelling. So their assumption, the police, the three officers that get there, their assumption is that it's called a um, a partial suspension. If you were to exit and you didn't want to do a full suspension, which is likely more daunting, this could be a way to do it where you're sitting and you're using the weight of your neck or just propelling your head forward to constrict your airways. Now, the problem with this is some sources say that it's common. Some say that it's not. The biggest thing is most of the time, if it is common, it seems, and I couldn't get accurate statistics on this, so please don't quote me. It seems that most people will do a lot of drugs or alcohol before they exit in this method just because it's your survival instinct to get up, you know, to stop the process. Sandra was pronounced dead at the scene at 11.46 a.m. on February 4th, 2021. She was only 23 years old. One of the first things the officers did was they pulled the CCTV footage from the apartment building to see when Sandra was last seen entering her apartment. They just wanted to get a more accurate time of death. They combed through the footage and they see a few things that are very interesting. Monday, February 1st. So remember, she's found Thursday morning, February 4th. Monday, she's seen in and out of her unit, picking up packages from the mailroom, getting food delivered. And interestingly enough, Monday night, she goes outside to her car with a snow shovel and a snowbrush. 
she's seen on CCTV cameras wiping off all the snow from her car, basically. Mm-hmm. So why would someone scrape off the snow from their car at around 5.30 p.m.? Because they have plans to drive it the next morning and they don't want to do it in the morning. Sandra is seen entering the lobby elevator and presumably goes back to her apartment unit at around 5.30 p.m. Now, we don't have CCTV from each individual floor of the building, but where else would she have gone after entering the elevator? That was the last time she was seen. Monday, February 1st at 5.30 p.m. Then just four hours later, someone strange appears on the CCTV cameras. And just to give you size reference, when I saw pictures of Sandra on the CCTV camera, she looks very normal sized, maybe a little bit shorter than average, but she looks like a normal human standing in the lobby waiting for the elevator. The elevator buttons come up to or above her belly button. So, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of a petite girl. Four hours later, at around 9.30 p.m., a man that nobody in the leasing office recognizes, a man wearing a black jacket, a black hood, a mask, and black work boots, he's got his head angled down the whole time that he's in the lobby. It's almost like he's hiding from the cameras. And the one thing to note about this man, other than the fact that nobody in the building management recognizes him as a resident of the building, nobody knows who he is. But he also is very massive. He's tall, he's burly. The elevator buttons come down below hip level for him. For Sandra, they were basically at her chest. If you're watching the visual episode on YouTube or Spotify, you'll see, but this man makes the lobby look miniature sized. Hypothetically speaking, if Sandra were to try and touch the top of this man's head, she would have to jump. And even then, I'm not sure that she would be able to. At 9.15 p.m., the mystery masked man enters the building. He is seen leaving at 9.43 p.m. He was in the building for 28 minutes, the day that Sandra was last seen alive. But we don't know if he went to Sandra's place, right? Not right now. Okay. But we will soon. Authorities asked around to the neighbors to see if they had heard anything that night coming from Sandra's unit. But since her apartment was somewhat isolated, nobody heard a thing. The officers got to work photographing the apartment. They went through the living room, the kitchen, and it was in the kitchen that something caught their eye. Just like hidden in plain sight amongst the clutter is this black rectangular shaped paper. It's a tiny black and white photograph. It's blurry. It's got a bunch of curved lines everywhere. And Inside is this dark black oval with a tiny white blob. It's a sonogram. Sandra Birchmore was pregnant. In the police report, the officer stated, despite all the clutter, all items appeared to be in their intended locations and no items appear to have been knocked over or strewn about in an unintended manner. Basically saying, she's just messy. The wall showed no signs of scuff marks or indentations. No drag marks were visible on the floor or carpeting. The police ruled her death a suicide. They definitively ruled out any and all foul play. But that just leaves a lot of questions to be unanswered. Like the masked man. You're saying it's just a coincidence that there was a hooded masked man that entered the building that nobody in the management team recognized, entered the building the night that Sandra was last seen alive. That's just a coincidence. And he only stayed for 28 minutes. What was he doing for 28 minutes? And if it was somebody that had nothing to do with Sandra, why wouldn't they just come forward? Like, oh, that's me. I was visiting my friend that lives in unit 891. I don't even know this Sandra woman, but like, just to clarify, that's me. Are they going to find out her estimated time of death? It's like that time is the belief. Whoa. Yeah, because she okay. um, stopped contacting people. There were no text messages or calls like abruptly after. And the way that Sandra was found hanging on the floor with a strap tied to the door handle, it would mean that Sandra would have to actively move her neck forward to be constricting her airways enough. So for several minutes, she would have to fight against her survival instincts. Also, this is a very intentional action. It's very common for people to leave a note or even a message or text message before something like this. And there was nothing. The only thing was her entire kitchen, her living room, bedroom, they were a mess. It looked like someone was looking for something. It's really unclear how the police differentiated between the mess they found in Sandra's apartment from just bad cleanliness from a mess that indicated that there was a fight or altercation. Another thing was Sandra was also pregnant. She was really excited about it, had just recently picked up a baby seat from the package room. Allegedly, there was also male DNA found in Sandra's underwear at the time of her death. And next to her knee, just out of reach, was Sandra's phone. 
where the police would find thousands of messages between Sandra and police officers from the Stoughton Police Department. Who was the masked man? Who is the father of Sandra's baby? All signs pointed to one of Stoughton's own police officers. According to some anonymous sources, so take this with a grain of salt, everyone knew that the kids in the Stoughton Police Explorers program were flirting with the police officers. And the issue is, none of the adults did anything about it. It's not the kid's problem, it's the adult's problem. Some might even argue that a lot of these adults, literal police officers, either turned a blind eye or even encouraged the kids to flirt with adults. Robert Devine was the leader of the Stoughton Police Explorers program, the program that teaches local kids special skills that might come handy in life later, like CPR, working with police animals. It's said that the minors were developing very natural crushes on the police officers. And this is such a natural part of developing is to form interest and connections with people that are around you. It said that many of the girls, they were trying to get alone time with him in his office. They would try to flirt with him in ways that were very obvious, not just to Officer Robert Devine, but to all the officers that even oversaw the Police Explorers program. They would wear low-cut shirts that felt very intentional. And if you're thinking of blaming the child or anything like that, I think that is incredibly misguided. I think having these crushes on people are normal. I think children are exploring their emotions and it's up for the adults to create these boundaries that are safe for the kids while they develop. I think it's normal. I don't think that children are ever to blame. And I think, again, it's the responsibility of the adults that are watching over them to inform them or nicely inform them that this is not appropriate, create a boundary, discuss this with their parents. Especially when you're a cop. Yeah. But to Robert Devine, it seemed like he liked it. That's an opinion of mine, okay? Not a fact. Some sources state that he would have young 12 to 13-year-old girls in his police car, in his patrol car, in his personal car, and he did not act like an adult around these kids, is what is alleged. He acted like he was one of them. Allegedly, he would ask them to come out and hang out with him in his office. Just hang out with him. He would allegedly say things like, come find me when you're 18, he would flirt with them. People wow. said he was almost like that douchey jock asshole that a lot of kids gravitate towards when they're 12 because, you know, it's like a 12-year-old. But he was acting like that as like a 30-year-old. 13-year-old Sandra could not wait to join that group. I mean, she had no freaking idea who Robert Devine was, but she really, really, really loved the police. She loved them. She loved anything that had to do with law enforcement and she wanted to be an officer one day. Sandra was the type of kid, if she saw a police officer, she would strike up a conversation with them, ask them questions, take pictures with them. She would set her profile picture on Facebook of her with local cops. And she genuinely thought like these are real life heroes, which I know right now there is a ton of discourse about the citizens' relationship with law enforcement agencies, and I think it's completely valid and we should be having these conversations. And the sentiment regarding law enforcement has been shifting because a lot of the heinous crimes committed by said officials have been coming to light. But a few things to remember here. Sandra's 13, and it just felt like she just wanted some stability in her life. And to her, because her home life wasn't that consistent, authority figures teachers, police officers, firefighters, doctors, they all just made her feel safe. They felt very stable. They felt like they set the laws and they enforced them and it's security. So to give you some context, Sandra has what everybody described as kind of a quote, sucky life. Nobody said it in like a demeaning or malicious way. She genuinely just was not dealt the best cards. And it sucked even more because when someone's not dealt the best cards and they start acting out or they commit crimes, you still feel sympathy for them. But it's almost like, man, why are you doing this? But to Sandra, I mean, she's still trying her best like every day with her shitty cards. Her dad was never in the picture. And I don't know if it's the cause of this, but people said that Sandra was always looking for some sort of connection, especially with father figures. People said that Sandra had this very young, almost naive emotional approach to life. She struggled to maintain friendships with people her age. And growing up, she would spend a ton of time in the guidance counselor's office because she felt like she was being bullied by her classmates. Some netizens suspect that because she wasn't able to fully be a kid during her childhood, she would hold on to that childish side of her for longer than most people would. 
which isn't like inherently a bad thing, but I do think that it does make her more vulnerable. And this is purely speculation and even just like a random theory, but it does seem like Sandra was looking for connections. But it's not like she had none. So she had her mom, Denise. She had her aunt and her grandmother. They were like the three mother figures in her life that would do anything for her. And the reason that Sandra was even in the police explorers program is, yeah, she had a genuine interest in law enforcement, but also because these three mother figures, they're so busy trying to put food on the table for Sandra. They don't have time to watch over her nonstop, even though they wished that that would be their only job. So they send her to this police explorers program because think about it. I mean, spending your free time as a teenager with police officers, that feels so much safer than whatever wild crowd that she might get involved with at school, right? Sandra joins the Stoughton Police Department's Explorer Program. It's a 10-week program from the local police department where it introduces kids 14 and up to what it's like to being an officer. She would stay a police explorer for six years. The first year that she gets into the program, it's like right when she turns 14. She was waiting for that day just so she can apply. She's a teeny tiny 14 year old. She's the shortest, smallest in the group that year. I mean, if you look at this picture of her, she's like the little runt of the group. I imagine she's the type that everyone would call tiny but mighty because of how tiny she is. Or they called her one tough cookie. That's what they called her. And at the Explorer program, she's putting in the work. She's doing push-ups in the parking lot, going on ride-alongs. I mean, this girl had no fear. She was no longer that little girl crying in the guidance counselor's office because she's getting bullied. She feels like she's got purpose in this program. Now, just look at the picture of how tiny she is. And the officers would allegedly ask her to meet up with them at restaurants, share meals with them, add them on Facebook, and start messaging them. She would even visit the officers at their homes to babysit their children for them. And as Sandra got older, her admiration and her devotion to these officers, it only grew. When Sandra was 18, I mean, this is already after, what, four years of being under the officer's guidance, if you will. Her mom passed away. Yeah, Sandra's mom passed. And Sandra was devastated. Like, we don't know the exact reason for Denise's passing, but we do know that it was likely somewhat abrupt. She had been sick for a while, but she was only 52 years old. And I think it's still shocking for loved ones when a family member passes that young. And then Sandra lost her grandmother the next month. And then like a year or two later, she loses her aunt. People who knew Sandra said it was really tough. There was this immediate shift in her personality. She was retreating even more. She craved stability and love even more. She was desperate to just be accepted by someone that she respected. And to her, that was the police officers at the Explorers program. Allegedly, she told friends that police officers, due to the nature of their job, are very stressed out. And if she can do anything to relieve some of that stress for them, she would be more than happy to do it. And it does seem like maybe that's something that an officer told Sandra. After Sandra's death, an internal affairs investigation was kickstarted by the police department. Okay, so this is where it gets very confusing. Sandra's death was ruled a suicide. And that is not an open case. That is not an open homicide investigation. There is no investigation to see if there was any foul play into her actual death. But there is an internal affairs investigation that is focusing on all of the police officers that were in her phone, that were texting her, that were messaging her, that were meeting up with her. And what they're doing is they're just looking for violations of police conduct. They're just trying to see, hey, did you break the rules at work? They're not investigating these police officers to see, did you kill Sandra? Not saying that anybody did, but it's not one of those investigations. It's just, hey, we told you no sexting at work. Did you sext at work? It's like that. And there are a lot of police officers that were in Sandra's messages trying to talk to her. So let's go through all of them. The very, very difficult thing about this is that nobody knows who Sandra's child's father is. And uh, it becomes a whole thing. But if there are a set of identical twins and they initiate relations with the same woman and she ends up getting pregnant, a standard paternity test cannot tell which identical twin is the father. A standard paternity test looks at about 15 or so markers in the DNA. Identical twins are called identical twins because their DNA is almost identical. So to see the very few, if any, differences in their DNA, you would have to use a test that looks at like 6 billion or so DNA markers. 
And even if you do that, you still need to sequence the entire genome, the entire complete set of DNA of each twin, the mother and the child. And even if you do that, sometimes it's still impossible. Sometimes it, you still won't have a clear answer on which identical twin is the father. And this is usually after tens of thousands of dollars have already been spent trying to figure it out. Officer William Farwell was one of the first police officers that were interviewed by state police after Sandra's body was found. And just to show you kind of how casual this interview is, it's not in a police room. It's not at the police station. He's sitting in a police car in the parking lot of one of these like suburban shopping plazas with the person interviewing him. Officer William initially states that, yeah, he met Sandra years and years ago when she joined the police explorers program. He was at that point an adult. He was 27. She was 15. That was like a decade ago, right? But he hadn't talked to her much afterwards. I mean, he did at one point in 2018. Oh yeah, he did talk to her in 2018. He introduced her to a friend of his that was in the army because Sandra was like, hey, I want to join the army. Does anybody have any connections with army recruiters? So he connected them. Sandra didn't end up making it into the army and they kind of kept in touch a little bit afterwards, which, you know, now that he's bringing it up, William's like, okay, maybe I will admit that I probably did a few things that I shouldn't have done. Now, this is all paraphrasing. And he stated that he did text her during his shift. It's basically telling your boss, I was texting for personal use during work hours. It's not that big of a deal. It's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't have done that. He did state that he also broke rules by visiting her at a restaurant while he was on shift. So again, imagine you're at work and you're like, hey, I gotta go leave and get a coffee break, but you go meet a friend of yours it's like okay it's not the end of the world but i guess you could say you did something bad but he's like you know nothing else happened initially william denied having any sort of sexual relationship with sandra but investigators found facebook messages between the two on sandra's devices that proved otherwise so now william admits okay fine 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 our relationship did turn sexual but that that was not when i met her when she was a kid no no, no it was maybe like two years ago and for a while it was fun, but you know, I'm married, I've got kids. And one time Sandra allegedly approached William while he was out and about with his family. This is like June, 2020. He said that he was, that's where he drew the line. She can be a mistress, but the mistress can't talk to the wife. He's basically saying this is unacceptable behavior. He cut her off, but they kind of stayed in contact. So it wasn't like cold turkey. But then he later says that the last time he slept with Sandra and saw her was December of 2020. Now, a few things are kind of odd about this statement, according to netizens. William stated that he cut her off presumably sometime in June of 2020. But then he admits later that he was on and off with her. And then he later admits that he was sleeping with her in December of 2020. And then he states that was the last time he saw her. However, phone records indicate that William went to Sandra's apartment complex January of 2021. And this was like after midnight. We don't know what they did when they met up. It could have been nothing. It could have been something. But it's just the fact that the date keeps moving closer and closer to her death date. Mm -hmm. She passed February of 2021. Yeah, and the guy's hiding a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a strange, right? But even stranger, and the part that netizens cannot get over, is that the internal affairs investigation uncovered that Officer William used the criminal justice information services system that law enforcement uses to run checks on people for official police business. He used it to search up Sandra over the years, repeatedly. You know when you check up on someone on social media, you're doing it with a reason? If you're going into the criminal justice information services, it's nothing even compared to that. It's very serious. So to give you further context, the criminal justice information services are a division within the FBI that is also a massive database on people. And by the name of it, criminal justice information services, it sounds like a help desk. It sounds like a little receptionist, but it's not. It is one of the largest divisions within the FBI. The CJIS serves to combat crime, terrorism inside the U.S. and overseas, and it's available for law enforcement agencies at federal, state, and local levels to help with their investigative process. There is a lot that officers can pull from a CJIS. For one, this is the world's largest database of fingerprints with over 77 million fingerprints. They also have th over 3 million iris images. What's up? Okay, so this part is scary. So iris is 
part of your eye and it's eye recognition software. It's probably one of the most accurate methods of identifying people out there right now. And it's very speedy. There seems to be conversations that are happening that the FBI is going to switch over from fingerprints to iris scans. Iris, yeah. Huh. So is that the airport stuff? Yes. Okay, so iris recognition is one of the fastest biometric matching models on the market. So you know when you go to the airport right now, if you're traveling internationally, they might try to get you to do fingerprints. And it takes very long and you have to have the fingerprint scanner and it's like a whole process. You got to move your fingerprint around. They're saying that iris recognition systems can probably handle very large populations with speed. Like you're talking one camera, one door, people are just walking in and out and it can scan their iris. So that's the future, I think. I don't know if we agree with it, but that's the future and that's food for thought. And you might see it starting to happen at airports. It said that airlines are trying to switch over to iris recognition boarding because you can lose your wallet. You can lose your boarding pass. But quote, you always have your eye with you. You don't have to worry if you left it somewhere or if someone else is using it when they shouldn't. And it is kind of terrifying that the FBI probably has one of the larger databases of iris scans. They're very hard to replicate. So there's that. But just to give you an idea of how insane the CJIS division in the FBI is, they have a 990-acre campus in West Virginia, and one of the buildings located there is a 360,000-square-foot building that is, quote, dedicated to the analysis and advancement of biometrics or human characteristics to aid identification. So you can just only imagine how much sensitive biometric data is in a file like that. The CJIS facility is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The CJIS stated, we don't shut down. We provide the research and analytical review required by law enforcement. So if someone calls in a tip or emails a tip about a potential terrorist threat, domestic or international, the information is processed through CJIS. They're heavily involved in monitoring fugitives, providing assistance for searching for missing persons. It can be used on a civil level, but that's a whole nother story. In terms of law enforcement, this is not a giggle gaggle process. Law enforcement officers have to be routinely trained on how to use the CJIS and how to make sure that it's safe and secure. These types of searches are tightly regulated. Law enforcement officers have to go through various levels of training just to be able to utilize it. It's like beaten into law enforcement's heads. You cannot just look at anyone you want. This is sensitive data. It needs to be for police use. There have been stories of law enforcement agents of police being let go from their jobs, fired, because they're looking up like their ex-wives. So these are just some examples, and I'm sure it gets a lot more detailed than this if you run a CJIS on someone. You get the full criminal records. This is not just court documents. You can even get access to audio and video information. So crime scene photos, surveillance videos, recorded interviews that have not seen the light of day in the public, fingerprints, biometric data, iris scans, identity history, property history, vehicle data, vehicle history. I'm sure some people have more on their files than others, but it's basically in short, Every single thing that the FBI has on everyone is going to be in there. But he's searching a little girl? Or- he was searching Sandra when she's like 21, 22, likely. But why? Because current investigations and warrants are also typically listed on CJISs. And William was not only searching Sandra, but he was searching himself. Yeah. It's kind of odd, okay? Maybe he's checking if someone stole his identity and that's being shown. But it feels a little strange to look yourself up. Do a full criminal background check on yourself multiple times throughout the years unless you think something is going to change. You're worried that someone is going to start investigating you. Mm. It feels like you have something to hide. Uh. That's the feeling. This is an opinion, not a statement of fact, though. So from 2017 to 2021, William ran 24 presumably unwarranted searches on himself and Sandra. Other strange things uncovered in the questioning were text messages between William and Sandra that showed William encouraging Sandra to do something. But what was he encouraging her to do? It's redacted from the report, so the public has no clue what he was encouraging her to do. The report stated that William coerced Sandra via text message multiple times, 
But what was he coercing her to do? We don't know. It's redacted. When William was asked about the baby Sandra was pregnant with, he stated he was sure that it definitely was not his. Even though he had intimate relations with her, he said Sandra told him who the father of the baby was. It was his twin brother, Officer Matthew Farwell. Matthew Farwell was about to be a father. Again. His wife was heavily pregnant and gave birth the day after Sandra was last seen alive. And now he's being asked about Sandra's pregnancy. Officer Matthew turned in his iPhone and his work phone because he, quote, had nothing to hide, but he did delete any contact that he made with Sandra from his phones, which kind of goes against the whole I have nothing to hide statement, in my opinion, but I digress, right? Matthew said that he knew Sandra since she was really, really young, since she was in the police explorers program. He was 27, she was 14, and he knew that she had just this really troubled life. He would still keep tabs on her from time to time because he wanted to make sure that she was doing all right. When Matthew was asked to elaborate further about his relationship with Sandra, he stated that sometime in 2020, so when Sandra was 21, 22, they started an intimate relationship. He got super drunk one night. They engaged in relations, but it only happened like two or three times. And the last time it happened was the end of October of 2020. So a few months before she passed, which if you do the calculations, she was pregnant February 2021. The last time that they engaged in relations was October 2020. I mean, she could very well be pregnant with Matthew's child, but it just, it didn't really add up perfectly. When asked about that, Matthew stated, I mean, yeah, she told me she was pregnant December of last year in 2020, and that's two months before she passed, and she said the baby was mine. Matthew stated, but I was confident the baby was not mine, because sure, I could have gotten her pregnant in October, but she specifically told me that her due date was September of 2021, which I tried to calculate, but that means the date of conception was probably around December, the same month that Matthew claimed Sandra told him she was pregnant. And he argued the dates don't add up. If she got pregnant in December 2020 and the last time that they were intimate was October 2020, how could the baby be his? So does the twin brothers know each other? They're both seeing her? They do know that? It seems like it. And now they're blaming onto each other? Seems like it. I mean, that's what you could, I guess, extract and theorize and comprehend from the reports, not stating it's fact. It could be something that you think afterwards right matthew said that he went to break up with sandra and when he was asked when he said monday february 1st he stated he was the masked man on the cctv camera he stated to officers that he asked sandra if he could stop by and his plan was to break up with her his wife was about to give birth to baby number three and maybe he didn't find it morally upstanding to continue seeing sandra on the side Matthew stated that his wife knew about the affair but was unaware that Sandra was pregnant and that Sandra was claiming that Matthew was the father. He said that night when he went to Sandra's, she just kept trying to tell him that the baby was his. And he told her, you're crazy. The baby's not mine. Choice words were exchanged between the two of them, but Matt said he was calm and very straightforward with her and just laid it down. He was focusing on keeping Sandra calm and keeping things from escalating, but still he wanted to get his point across. He told her it's over for good. The conversation lasted 28 minutes. And as he walked out of the apartment, he just deserted Sandra in the kitchen, walked out the door and just blocked her on everything. It seemed like the picture Matthew was painting was that Sandra was just too into him, obsessed, really. She was the obsessed girl that had been yearning for him for years and years. And it was a drunken mistake that he slept with her. And then, of course, he did it a few more times. But now that he's trying to shake her off because he meant nothing by any of that and he's got a wife and kids that he loves, now she's like clinging her claws into him, claiming that she's pregnant with his baby. But the timeline doesn't make sense. So he went to break up with her so he could focus on his new baby and his wife. But she was so distraught that right after he left, presumably, she exited her life. Which, you know, I have seen some netizens bring up the very interesting circumstances surrounding his visit to Sandra's that night. So this is in the middle of a blizzard, remember? And maybe if you've been living in the Northeast your whole life, Category 3 blizzards mean nothing to you. But from what I can tell on Reddit, Category 3 blizzards seems like the type of snowstorm where you don't want to be caught running around town running errands. So if we're correct, he went to go see her in the middle of a Category 3 blizzard on the eve of his wife's birth, but he said that he broke up with her back in December of 2020. 
but he went to go break up with her in person out of nowhere two months later, February of 2021. Which is very odd, more so if you think about the fact that his wife is literally about to give birth. Look, I don't know, if your wife is going to give birth any day now, I would imagine that you want to stay alert. You want to make sure that you're there to help her with whatever she might need, especially if there's a blizzard raging outside. Yeah, like what if the wife goes into labor right there? Exactly. I mean, but that doesn't mean he's guilty of anything. Like we're not insinuating anything. We're just saying if this is all proven to be true, it's just a very interesting choice that he might have made from our personal opinions. Matthew also mentioned that as far as the father of the baby goes, he states that Sandra was sleeping with a lot of people, so it had to be someone else's. Matthew was 27 when he met 15-year-old Sandra, and for almost 10 years of Sandra's life, her only constant would be the police officers that she looked up to at Stoughton Police Department. The chief of the Stoughton Police Department ordered an internal investigation, like I stated, into any and all officers who may have had relations with Sandra. Now, at this point, there were two investigations going on, if you will. One into Sandra's death that was closed and ruled a self-committed exit, and the internal affairs investigation, which was solely set up to, quote, determine any violations of policies, procedure, rules, and regulations of the Stoughton Police Department by any of its employees. Some netizens have stated, well, yeah, if you read in between the lines, the investigation is just to see if they broke rules. It's not explicitly stated that they intend to bring criminal charges against the people that they're investigating, even if they uncover policy violations. But neither of the investigations would look into foul play, really, or even open the door to the idea that Sandra was killed. Not saying that she was, but they wouldn't really even entertain the idea, the possibility. Sandra's death was never investigated as a homicide as of right now, and that is why netizens are very upset. And again, I'm not saying someone needs to go down for it, even if it's not a homicide. It's just a matter of, shouldn't we investigate it? And I think one of the reasons this case started gaining a ton of attention is not even from what we know, but it's from what we don't know. If you go through the official reports that were released to the public on this case, it's a giant black box. All official reports regarding this one, redacted, redacted, redacted. Everything is redacted. Redacted, redacted, redacted. Redacted, messaged, redacted, and deceased, redacted, redacted, redacted. And that in itself is a question of why the hell is everything redacted in this case? What are the police hiding? Especially when it involves the investigation of so many different police officers. So redactions happen in official reports when the findings or information are not pertinent to the case. So for example, if I saw a crime happen and I really like peaches and apples, but my name would probably be redacted from the entire situation just because there's no reason to put my name into that if I'm not part of the crime. You don't want just random civilians as witnesses, their information being released to the public. Or maybe whatever information I stated to the police needs to be filed and written down. But if it has no relevance to the crime, it could be redacted. That's a choice that the police make. Or things are redacted when they are sexually explicit in nature. So if we read between the lines, which it feels like we're kind of forced to do in this case, is it safe to assume that everything was redacted because it's explicit in nature? There is a 50,000 page PDF document with all of Sandra's messages from her phone and Facebook Messenger going back to 2019. The PDF document was called Blacklight because on the surface, the story looks simple and clean, but you shine a black light on it and you turn up blood. So of course, none of these 50,000 pages are available to the public. 50,000 pages. Yes. It's not even 50,000 words. No, pages. 50,000 pages. Mm -hmm. Like how many books is that? A book is like 300, I don't, what? Like three to 600 pages, yeah. Yeah, 50,000 pages. It's a lot. And I mean, we don't know even an idea of what's in there because everything else has been redacted. So let's talk about the people that was investigated during the internal investigations. So we know both the Farwell brothers were having intimate relations with Sandra. And most netizens seem to theorize that Matthew Farwell, the one whose wife was pregnant, is most likely, in their personal opinion, to have been the father of Sandra's child. And it's heavily speculated, again, this is just an allegation as of right now, that Matthew was 27 when he allegedly started a relationship with 15-year-old Sandra. In the heavily redacted report that was released to the public, it says text messaging developed from the MSP, Massachusetts State Police. The investigation indicated that Farwell had redacted with Sandra Birchmore when she was 15 and that Farwell redacted. 
and it seems safe to assume that Matthew's relationship with Sandra was a lot more than he was letting on. In just the past year of Sandra's life when she was alive, Matthew texted her thousands of times, thousands. And in some of these text messages, Matthew and Sandra talk about April 10th, 2013. This is a date from their past. This is back when Sandra was 15 years old and a police explorer. In those text messages, Sandra reminisces about something covered in a big black line because it's redacted. And Matt replies, smiley face, me too. Why was that in the file if it's not important? Why was it redacted if it's not sexually explicit? But then why isn't he charged or, you know? So those text messages could be be, I guess, evidence. But in situations like this, when something happened 10 years ago, you would need a witness. And the only witness to that would be dead, Sandra. And interesting, in the worst way possible, it seems like the Farwell twins knew that they were both having intimate relations with Sandra. And now that she was dead, they're trying to downplay their relationships with her. William made it seem like he and Sandra were not even that close. But he also introduced her to two other men, another officer from the town over and a military recruiter, which we talked about. But it's alleged that Sandra had inappropriate relations with both of these introduced men. And if the speculations and the theories, which are not facts, but if the theories are correct that Sandra was likely potentially groomed as a minor during her time at the police explorers program, this detail could have a much more sinister meaning. A lot of netizens feel like if all of those things are true, Introducing more officers to Sandra is almost like passing a vulnerable woman on. The identity of these two men were redacted to hell and back in the official reports. Except one time. There was a mistake. One name was accidentally left unredacted just one single time in the whole report. So let's go over these two men. We know that there was a military recruiter that Sandra was introduced to. Allegedly, he's part of the Massachusetts Army National Guard. And we don't know what kind of relationship he had with Sandra, but the report simply calls it inappropriate communications. We don't know much about him, but the second man in question, we know more about because his name was accidentally left unredacted. Officer Joshua Heal. According to the Case podcast, he's an officer in the neighboring town's police department, so not Stoughton. But Joshua was friendly with both Robert Devine and the Farwell twins, so all three of them. He doesn't work for SPD, like I said, but he works as a school resource officer for the Abington Police Department, and he worked as the animal control officer for Stoughton. He was in charge of rescuing strays, keeping animal life in good relations with the human inhabitants of the county. And we don't know for certain his involvement in the case, but the internal investigations report had stated that Officer Joshua Heal has, quote, direct knowledge of the relevant parts of this investigation and is a material witness. According to his first interview, Officer Joshua stated that he knew of the Farwell twins and they were friendly, but they weren't necessarily close, you know? But only 30 minutes into this internal affairs interview, Joshua stopped it and stated he wanted representation before continuing. Now, remember how I said this is a case that reading between the lines is like the only thing that the public can do right now, just because everything has been so redacted. We know that Officer Joshua Heal worked in the Stoughton Animal Control Department, and the Stoughton Animal Control has a shelter that they run, so civilians can adopt pets from the shelter. A series of actions happened according to the internal investigation, and it's very interesting. So after Officer Joshua Heal is investigated or interviewed, the ones running the internal investigation requested, quote, all available pet adoption files from the local shelter. It seems like they were trying to find the papers for the cats that Sandra adopted from the shelter two to three years ago, the ones that the officers ran into during the wellness check. Nothing is discovered from this inquiry. Then, according to the case podcast, forensic analysis of a couch that was located in redacted was requested. Netizens have tried to read between the lines and theorize that the redacted location is the animal control shelter. If this theory is true, that means they requested forensic analysis of a couch located at an animal shelter. Why? Again, this is fully reading between the lines, full speculations, full theories, not facts. So let's go down a hypothetical theory, rabbit hole, fake reality world. We know it's likely that Sandra got at least one of her two cats from the shelter that Officer Joshua Heal had involvement in since he worked for the Stoughton Animal Control Department. And this is the Stoughton Animal Control Shelter. 
The shelter keeps all adoption records for every animal, but there are no official adoption files under Sandra's name for either of her two cats, but she stated to multiple people that she adopted her cat from that specific shelter. So can we conclude that they were adopted under the table? That she didn't formally adopt them? which means that Sandra might have not had to pay the adoption fee, which, if it's anything like other shelters, they can range anywhere between free to $200, depending on the pet. Okay, so that's weird. Sandra allegedly adopted her cat from the shelter, yet there are no records of her adopting a cat from that said shelter, and now the internal investigations team is requesting forensic analysis of a random couch from the redacted location? Netizens came up with a theory that is not rooted in fact, just a theory, that Sandra was asked for a sexual favor and in return, Joshua Heal would waive the adoption fee. That is the theory. It is heavily speculated that perhaps the sexual favor was exchanged on a couch at the redacted location, and that is why they want to run forensics on the couch and ask for the adoption records. If this theory is true, technically, Sandra would have been of age at the time of the theorized incident, and allegedly, Officer Joshua has admitted to having sexual relations with Sandra, and allegedly stated that Sandra would come over to the shelter to see him here and then, but that was the extent of their relationship. Wait, he said that? He said that he did have sexual relations with her, but I don't think that he said it was on the couch. Mm. He was just like, sometimes she would come by the shelter to like talk to me. I never told her to come to the shelter, was like the vibe he was giving. Like, very nonchalant. Like, yeah, I mean, she would come and talk to me. But he also allegedly stated that a ton of other police in SPD were sleeping with Sandra, which I personally don't feel like matters. Like, I don't like the implication of that, and we'll get into that later. But, like, the fact that he's throwing it out there in the interview, like, well, it's not just me, is kind of odd, in my opinion. Also, in an interesting development, Officer Joshua agreed to do another interview with the police chief, but he said that he would only do it as long as his police chief signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, which is a contract stating that you won't tell anyone anything you hear during this interview. What? But one thing to note is that NDAs do not cover crimes. So if Officer Joshua were to confess to a crime that he committed, the NDA would be moot point. Imagine like... Yeah, I'll agree to the investigation, but like, here's an NDA. Yeah, it's just very it's odd opposite behavior. opposite of this. It's the opposite of being cooperative. Yeah. I've got nothing to hide. Just sign this NDA before I tell you everything I know about this. It's just very odd. Yeah. His chief, Chief Del Papa, was flabbergasted. In his 26 years of work, he had never, ever, ever heard of anybody asking for an NDA during a very serious internal affairs. Imagine showing up to the police and saying, I will tell you what you want to know. Sign an NDA, officer. It's just so bizarre. Officer Joshua did do a second interview with SPD where he was asked about his social media accounts and his interview transcript is heavily redacted. To give you an example, Redacted is familiar with Sandra's Redacted with Farwell. There were discussions between Heel and Sandra about Redacted, Redacted, and Redacted. Needless to say, even during the second interview, the investigators did not find Officer Joshua that credible. So he originally denied any relationship with Sandra. Later, when he was asked about an alleged sexual relationship between him and Sandra, he allegedly asked for a lawyer. But then he resumed the interview and allegedly had a whole story about how he was just this big brother to Sandra and he liked to give her advice so she would come to the animal shelter here and there just to like talk to him. Officer Joshua stated that Matthew installed a tracking device on Sandra's phone and he would constantly track her movements, watching her as she went to work or if she was visiting friends or going to the doctor. So he's kind of pushing this on Matthew for a while. Joshua Heal also casually mentioned that a bunch of officers used police computers to look at porn while they were at work. So, what? yeah, even with all the redacted statements and it's still unclear what the relationship between Sandra and Joshua was, if there even was one. But even with the redacted statements, netizens feel like there is a huge moral and ethical concern here. Netizens felt concerned, especially because Officer Joshua had a job as a school resource officer. He's got regular contact with minors, like more than just a regular patrol officer. And maybe, I don't know, he's not the best person to be around children. His alleged duties included being a comfort dog handler. Comfort dogs are used in certain schools for students who have a variety of neurodivergent needs or health conditions. The dogs are there to calm them down when they're experiencing heightened levels of stress so that they can go back to focusing on their studies. And if that really is his position, then students who are interacting with Officer Joshua 
with a comfort dog, not only are they vulnerable because they're children, but they're extra vulnerable because you really only seek out comfort dogs when you're in a state of heightened stress, anxiety, or physical distress. So that's alarming for some netizens that someone who is connected in some way, shape, or form to Sandra in general is also doing this as a career. And just to reiterate, all of this is purely speculation and theory. He was investigated internally by the police department, but those interviews are so heavily redacted to the point where we really have no idea what anyone is ever talking about. But there must have been something that Chief Del Papa did not like because he put Officer Joshua Heal on administrative leave. Eventually, the internal affairs investigation would conclude that Officer Joshua was completely dishonest during the entirety of the investigation and in violation of ethical rules of policing. Del Papa would fire him. So we've got the Farwell brothers, we have the military recruiter, Joshua Heal, and the internal investigation would also focus on Officer Robert Devine, the man who led the Stoughton Explorers program. He was actually a mentor for the Farwell twins before they became police officers. The Farwell brothers joined his very first Explorers program and they loved it. So Robert just perpetually took them under his wing for the rest of their careers. And trust me, the Farwell brothers are like one of the few that really love the Explorers program. A lot of ex-Explorers stated that Robert Devine would create a boy power atmosphere. Anonymous sources told the Case podcast, he, Robert, made us all very uncomfortable. He would specifically target kids with bad home lives because we were easy. He would make comments with the girls and then get violent with the boys it was very well known in town that he was a creep i'm not sure how authority or like teachers can deem this acceptable like touching 13 year olds on their shoulders and touching their hair another one stated i was around him a lot as a minor and he just made me so uncomfortable what's terrifying is he ran this program for over 10 years During the internal investigation, the investigators, they spoke with former police explorers who told them in a heavily redacted report that they had observed inappropriate behavior by Robert Devine and the Farwell twins while they served as instructors in the program. It was indicated that there had been kissing, hugging, and inappropriate contact in a closet. There were suggestive comments to the effect of, quote, come back and see me after you turn 18 that were made. So when the internal investigators, they started talking to Robert Devine about his relationship with Sandra, he just said, yeah, I mean, she was in one of my police explorers courses and that was it. All I remember is she had a difficult home life and she was obsessed with police officers, obsessed. She would come over once a week, even when the explorers program wasn't happening and bring coffee. But he never encouraged her behavior and he certainly did not have any communications with her afterwards. He stated he just now found out about Matthew Farwell's relationship with Sandra recently. Really? I mean, he hardly knew the girl. They never had any real conversations. Robert would later rectify this response and state that, okay, he kind of knew about Matthew and Sandra earlier than he stated. He said that he heard Sandra talking about dating Matthew, but he never really believed her because Sandra makes up stories and heavily embellishes them. So he didn't think anything of it at the time. Robert stated Sandra was obsessed with him and all the other cops, that even though Robert was not interested in even pursuing a platonic friendship with Sandra, she would constantly bring coffee and, quote, find him. The investigators told Robert that they had not found any direct forms of communication between him and Sandra yet, and he smiled and responded, because you won't find it. That turned out to be false. He was found to have been in direct contact with Sandra from November 27th, 2020 to February 1st, 2021. The last day she was known to be alive. Oh, they were talking too? Yes. Oh my gosh. And if I'm being precise, maybe Robert Devine wasn't talking to Sandra, but Marty Riggs was. Marty Riggs was a random profile on Facebook that Sandra's devices showed her being in contact with consistently. From context clues of the messages between Sandra and this Marty Rigg character, a few things can be picked up. One, Marty Riggs was a cop. There were conversations about meeting in a patrol car and meeting up in Stoughton, so it could be assumed that he's a Stoughton police officer. But the Stoughton Police Department don't have an officer named Marty Riggs. Two, context clues from the messages that we are not privy to seems to indicate that Marty Riggs is none other than Robert Devine. So he made a fake, allegedly, he made a fake Facebook profile to talk to Sandra with. When Robert Devine was asked about Marty Riggs, he said that his account had been hacked because it was like connected to his email. 
After this, Robert Devine quickly resigned from the force. Well, he retired and he stated that he was just a big brother to Sandra and that he would often give her life advice, especially about her relationship with Matthew. Go look over there. And that's all he did. You know, those were the main five investigated during the internal affairs. But just to show you how corrupt this police force is, one of the main investigators that worked on Sandra's case, so not the internal affairs investigation, they didn't really, I don't think they knew Sandra before her death. One of the wellness check officers that was overseeing the wellness check, his name is Trooper Dunn. And netizens uncovered that he too has a really weird past. He was involved in a major police brutality lawsuit just five months before he was investigating Sandra's death. Allegedly, Trooper Dunn noticed a car in the middle lane without an inspection sticker, which is, you know, not the worst crime ever, but it's not great. You don't want dangerous cars out on the road that haven't been inspected. So he pulls the car over. There are two Hispanic men in the car driving and in the passenger side. The driver explains this is just a rental, but Trooper Dunn notices the driver is not wearing his seatbelt. Then he looks the driver up. The driver has a previously dismissed firearms charge, which means the judge decided there was no reason to prosecute him for the charge. So someone pressed charges and then it's like, oh, actually, no, it's fine. Let it go. Maybe he didn't commit the crime. Like maybe nothing happened. Maybe it wasn't, you know, but for some reason, Trooper Dunn calls for backup. He's like, oh, I'm gonna need backup. These are criminals. And things just keep escalating from there. They claim they saw a pellet gun in the car. They pulled a gun out on the driver and the passenger. The driver's terrified, tries to explain they don't have a gun on them, but he gets pulled out into the middle of the pavement in the middle of traffic. Officer Dunn then proceeds to slam the driver's face onto the pavement, dig his knees into his back and allegedly punches him on the head and neck for good measure. All this violence over an inspection sticker. The driver sustained injuries to his right hip, right shoulder, wrist, and lower back because of this. He also spent a night in jail before the court decided that he did nothing wrong and dismissed literally all charges against him. So that's what he did five months before investigating Sandra's death. I don't even know how he still has a job to begin with, but he did. And he was reiterating in the police report that absolutely nothing seemed out of the ordinary at Sandra's place. Even the state of Sandra's apartment... He was like, yeah, I have nothing to see here. Everything is in its, quote, intended location. Which, side note, Stoughton does have a strange track record with their police department. And by strange, I guess it's more alarming than anything. One Stoughton police chief would be convicted of knowingly receiving stolen goods. It said that while he was the police chief, there was a running joke among civilians that if you wanted your house robbed, all you got to do is tell the police chief that you're going away on vacation and you would come home to a ransacked apartment. What is going on here? Like... Yeah. Is uh, okay. Another police chief was fired for misusing police resources, and another one publicly stated that he didn't think some of his own officers were quote mentally fit to carry guns. So I don't know <sighs> what's going on with the Stoughton p- Police Department. Side note: Stoughton, the town itself, is actually named after the Justice Stoughton, the man that oversaw the Salem witch trials. So, where is this again? Massachusetts. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. I would love to know, like, what are the locals saying about this? Because, oh, they're mad. Like, I cannot believe how freaking shady this is. Some locals actually feel like people are being dramatic about demanding an investigation into Sandra's death. So, I would say the majority of Stanton residents are very, very kind people. They've been holding protests and they're not even trying to ruin someone's life or like take down families like they're being accused of here and there, but they're genuinely just saying like we need to investigate her death. Yeah, and it just also like all the story about this explore program or these school students, like how are you okay with that? Like yeah. that's all we know so far from one person. What about rest of the kids? So most people are not okay with what's been going on, but there are like a few select residents that feel like we're just dragging Stoughton's finest through the mud. And I think one thing that's going to be very big during the upcoming lawsuit that I'm going to tell you about is that Sandra was not perfect. I mean, I don't think any single person is, but of course, when you're the victim of a crime and it just becomes like a fight for who has a stronger moral character. And it's just about dragging people through the mud. Sandra's home life was sucky. She never had it easy. And a lot of people said that she did act very emotionally naive and young for her age. But a lot of times that emotional immaturity, I guess is what they called it, it just translates into Sandra wanting to connect with people. 
She's a little bit too open. She's a little bit too vulnerable, and that's what they consider emotionally immature. I, I don't think anything she could have done is to blame、oh, when、yeah. she's surrounding herself with a bunch of officers. Exactly. That's like where you should you should feel the safest. Exactly. Especially when she was underage, even if she's of age. Yeah. When you're hanging out with these officers, <laughs> like. Yeah. How is she to blame? So I'm just telling you the words that they're using because I think it will come up later this month. They'll try to probably spin it into a way where it's a negative thing. I personally think that emotional immaturity, the way that it presented itself in Sandra, it just translated into a young woman that really desperately wanted to connect with people, and I don't think that's. Inherently, even a negative quality. People said that she was always in the moment with her students. She wanted to get to know every single one of her coworkers. And yeah, when we're living in a fast-paced life where everybody's on their phones and doing all these things, maybe it's annoying that someone is like constantly trying to ask you about your day. But I think it's just sweet. I think we're just maybe not used to it. She's a teacher. A teacher's assistant at the、oh. school. And you know there are people out there that always have these secret ulterior motives, and they want something from you, but they try to hide it. Sandra never did that. People constantly said she's such an open book, like she loves to tell everyone everything going on in her life, and it's not for any weird reason. She just wants to share this human life experience with others. She's the type of kid where other teenagers would try to be cool and like ignore their parents when they ask how was your day at school. But if you ask Sandra how's your day, she's so excited to tell you about how her day was. If she had a good lunch, she wants to tell you about it. If she saw a movie that she thinks you'll like, she wants to tell you about it. And it just doesn't make sense for her to also choose to exit. Those who knew Sandra stated that she was really excited about being pregnant. She literally could not not tell people. She told her friends, her neighbors, people at the supermarket line. She was just so happy and giddy. She even went as far to reach out to old friends from years ago that she lost contact with to rekindle a connection with them and share the amazing news. Her whole world was about her baby. She was shopping for baby supplies, a new stroller. She was in the process of planning her baby shower. She's looking at floor plans in her apartment building for a new unit because she's like, I probably need more space. A friend of Sandra said she was even planning the day to announce her pregnancy, which was February fourteenth, Valentine's Day, two weeks after she passed. So I guess if you're a very skeptical, theoretical person, you could theorize that maybe someone wanted her dead before she could announce it. The day before Sandra's death, she went down to the apartment package room and picked up a stroller. And even after her body was found, more baby supplies arrived in the package room of her apartment building for her. Sandra's cousin stated Sandra was extremely psyched and happy. She always wanted to be a mother, and she was now having a child. Why would she exit? Another friend stated. It just doesn't make sense to me. I've known her since I was like six, seven years old. I know her patterns of behavior. I know what she's been through in life. If she was going to exit, she would have exited when her mother died, or when her grandmother died, or when her aunt died. She would not have exited over this. But does being pregnant and not having the father of your child want to be involved with your child change things for someone? Does it mentally affect them? Sources close to Sandra stated Sandra was not upset about raising a baby on her own. She just seemed more excited about being a mom than anything. But she did want a few things from the alleged father of the child. She wanted, allegedly, Matthew Farwell to sign the birth certificate and pay child support. But she didn't mind raising the baby all by herself. A family member of Sandra stated she wanted Sandra to back off of Matthew for a while. The way that Sandra was talking about Matthew and how she was having these struggles—he doesn't want to sign the birth certificate. He allegedly doesn't want to pay child support. Things were getting quote toxic. Another friend alleged that Matthew Farwell threatened Sandra before her death, saying, "If you don't terminate, I'm going to take care of the problem myself." This is alleged. Another friend of Sandra stated that Sandra told her about a fight that she got into with her married police officer boyfriend slash father of her child Matthew Farwell, and Sandra allegedly threatened to tell Matthew's wife about her pregnancy. Matthew took her phone away from her and screamed at her, "I wish you would just die." Allegedly, but I guess it could be argued that nobody really knows what's going on in someone's mind or in their life, and maybe Sandra's loved ones were blindsided and they don't want to believe that she could exit while pregnant. 
but there are a few other things that just don't really add up. Besides all the suspicious relationships with police officers, on the last day Sandra was seen alive, CCTV cameras of her apartment building showed her brushing the snow off her car. Why would she do that if she planned on exiting that night? That same day, she allegedly exited her life. She Snapchatted her coworker asking if they had school tomorrow because of the heavy snowfall. This message was sent minutes before Matthew Farwell showed up to her apartment. So just minutes before she had plans to show up to school, why would she ask if she had plans to exit? And everything we know about Sandra's personality, she's an open book. And I'm not saying these people cannot choose to self-exit, but she didn't leave a letter or a text message or anything. And is it really just a bizarre coincidence that Sandra was likely pregnant with potentially, maybe, a married police officer's child and then happened to exit her own life while pregnant? The official report stated Matthew Farwell had a longstanding redacted with the victim Sandra Birchmore and that his twin brother, Officer William Farwell, had a redacted relationship with the victim Sandra Birchmore. There was evidence that Officer Robert Devine had a redacted relationship with the victim Sandra Birchmore. And if all the allegations are true, if Matthew started a sexual relationship with Sandra when she was 15 and he was 27, it would have been illegal. The age of consent in Massachusetts is 16 years old. The final internal investigation stated that it cannot be proven that Matthew participated in unlawful acts, nor can it be proven that he passed her along to his twin brother and even other police officers, nor can it be proven that he was the father of Sandra's child because he won't consent to a DNA test. The text messages between him and Sandra might suggest that they had relationships that were darker than the public thinks. But you would need a testimony from a witness to prove it. And you would need a witness to give more information on what happened during the 28 minutes that Matthew Farwell was in Sandra's apartment. And that witness, Sandra Birchmore, is dead. Some people might call that a motive, but I will call it fascinating for legal purposes. Chief McNamara, the police chief of Staunton Police Department, has stated this about Sandra's death and the internal investigation into her squad. She says, I stand before you today as a civil servant who is heartbroken. Sandra was failed by, manipulated by, and used by the people of authority that she admired and trusted right until her final days. Birchmore was a vulnerable person, one constant in her life since childhood, her unwavering admiration for police officers, of those serving in the military, people in uniform, and people with oaths and duties to protect and serve. This admiration led her to form relationships with men who were willing to take advantage of her. The police chief also stated, all three men, the Farwell brothers and Robert Devine, have violated their oaths of office and should never have the privilege of serving any community as a police officer. Through a sustained, deliberate combination of lies, deceit, and treachery, they violated the policies and core values of the Stoughton Police Department, not to mention human decency. Some netizens think if you take this at surface level value, Chief McNamara seems to be cracking down on her own department. But many netizens think that she's just doing this for show because why else is everything redacted to hell and back? Some netizens think that the heavily edited and redacted police reports contradict her statements that she wants to be open and punish the three offenders. Some believe that she's pretending to be harsh on her own squad when in reality, her releasing overly redacted reports ensures that nobody actually gets in any real trouble. As long as they can no longer work as police officers again, let's just sweep it under the rug. While some details of these official reports should be redacted to protect those in an ongoing investigation, netizens just found that the report was over-redacted. There are hundreds of text messages, photos, and videos exchanged between Sandra and the three former Stoughton police officers, but not a single message has been revealed except vague descriptions of Sandra communicating with officers, meeting up with them at restaurants and parking lots. Netizens feel that this is to protect the police officers involved and ultimately the police department itself. Because as for the officers, nothing really has happened to them. Again, not saying that something should, but just stating, Matthew Farwell was placed on paid administrative leave after news of Sandra's death. Later, Matthew Farwell resigned from his position and is now allegedly working for his own trucking business called DMJ Transportation. He denied submitting to a DNA sample and polygraph, and his lawyer stated, Matthew Farwell has committed no crime. It would be highly invasive to him and his family's personal health to submit a DNA. And as expected, his DNA would reveal nothing of value. My client has no role in Miss Birchmore's death. He never encouraged her to take her own life or fear that she would take her own life. He is shocked and he is saddened. 
William Farwell, Matthew's twin, was placed on administrative leave, and he too would resign from his position. I believe he now works for the Transportation Security Administration. So yeah, the TSA. Joshua Heal was on administrative paid leave, then resigned from his position. We're not really sure what he's up to now. As for Robert Devine, because he retired from the police force before the internal investigations kickstarted, he's still receiving his full pension, $5,000 a month of taxpayer money. And that will continue because no conviction has been made. Again, not saying he's guilty of anything, but factually, he hasn't been convicted of anything. That is the truth, isn't it? But he does seem a little Sue happy. He wrote to the Stoughton Police Department regarding the internal investigation, and he said, at least in my case, this was a politically motivated sham against an employee who has consistently spoken out against leadership. So he's saying, I was consistently speaking out against the chief, and so this is all kind of like thrown on me, politically motivated. It speaks volumes that they released any findings to the media before even notifying me. Should you try to defame me at the end of this, I am prepared to resort to every legal means at my disposal to fight you. He is an attorney. He is a licensed attorney, so that's interesting. Yeah. He is an attorney? What? Yeah, he is a licensed attorney and a police officer. But he's still licensed to practice, yeah. From what I can tell. Allegedly. <laughs> but a few questions netizens have about all of this is... Matthew Farwell was allowed to refuse a DNA test and polygraph, even after he was caught lying in his interview about his relationship with Sandra. Would a normal civilian be given the same choice? Would it be a choice? Would you not just get a warrant? Why was Josh's name left in once, unredacted? Was it on purpose? Probably not, but still a blatant oversight considering the careful attention to blacking out any of the other important details. Why would Matt feel so strongly about meeting Sandra on the same night his wife was due to give birth in just a mere probably hours? And why was Sandra's death never, never at any point investigated as a murder? And I think it's really important to remember Sandra for who she is and well, who she was, because it's speculated that her name is about to get dragged through the mud. There is currently a wrongful death suit filed by Sandra's aunt, Darlene Smith, against Matthew Farwell, William Farwell, Robert Devine, Joshua Heal, the Stoughton Police Department, and the town of Stoughton. It accuses the three men of leading Sandra to take her own life after their repeated, quote, grooming, abuse, and inappropriate sexual abuse. The lawsuit accuses the men of systematically taking advantage of her young age and trust of authority figures to rope her into sexual relationships where they could psychologically abuse her. The lawsuit states that this stunted her growth into a young woman and eventually led to her death. A friend of Sandra stated, These men knew who they were dealing with, an innocent girl who was just looking for love and attention. And she didn't have an appropriate male figure in her life because her father wasn't in her life. So these guys became that, but they groomed her and used that to their advantage. So far, everyone listed in the lawsuit has responded by denying everything. Robert Devine went as far to file a motion to dismiss. Meanwhile, the twins, they stated that Sandra's death was at least 50% her own fault. And Matthew's attorney stated he played no rule in the death and the district attorney charged him with no crime in connection with her case or death. Meanwhile, Joshua Heal, the one that worked at the shelter, is taking a very interesting approach. He's working very hard to get all of his files and records sealed so that nobody can see them from the public. He goes to... Great lengths to say that Sandra was having sex with lots of people, not just him. And it makes no sense for him to be listed in this lawsuit because it states that Sandra was groomed for 10 years, but he only knew Sandra for like five years. If he had it his way, he would want the files to be at the bottom of the ocean and only viewable by a Titan submersible. Joshua also tried to file a cross claim against the town of Stoughton to basically say, wait, no, I'm the real victim here. The only problem is Joshua has basically admitted to most of the accusations against him. Nevertheless, he accuses Stoughton of covering up the fact that Matthew Farwell may have killed Sandra. He also accuses the town of Stoughton of doing a bad job in the investigation, recklessly releasing his name to the public and ruining his career. It does seem like out of all the people listed, Joshua Heal, I personally haven't seen evidence that he knew Sandra when she was a minor. So maybe. B, he's going to try to argue that. I don't know, right? The next hearing is scheduled for December 20th of this year. And it's likely in cases like this, Sandra's name is just going to be dragged through the mud by the very people that hurt her. So whatever they're going to say about Sandra, let's try and remember. Sandra wanted to be a police officer because she felt safer on them. Because she knew what it was like to be a kid and not have the security. And she just wanted to return that to other kids that might be in the same position as her. And I think one of the biggest shames about all of this is that, you know, with the current sentiment towards law enforcement, 
Sandra would have been the type of police officer that police forces would need. Someone who genuinely cares about the welfare of people. Someone with compassion and empathy. But instead, she would pass mysteriously, surrounded by questionable figures that she trusted with her life. Before Denise, Sandra's mom passed away. She took the time to thank all of the people in Sandra's life and her daughter's life. And one of the people was Robert Devine. She wrote a letter to him. And the subject of her letter read, My Hero, Lieutenant Devine. She wrote about how thankful she was that Robert Devine was helping not just the community, but also helping her daughter, Sandra. At the time that Denise wrote this letter, if the allegations are true, Matthew Farwell, allegedly, would have been one year into an illegal sexual relationship with Sandra. Before Sandra's death, Robert Devine was also allowed to host a library book read. He went to the Stoughton Library Teddy Bear Story Hour, where kindergartners come to listen to adults read to them. And Robert Devine read Dr. Seuss's Oh, The Places You'll Go. And he stated, I read this to my little girl a lot. And the main reason is because it's about growing up and doing what you want to do when you grow up. Sandra will never get the chance to watch her child grow up. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we set? Okay. Oh, boy. This is Deputy (laughs) Police Chief Robert Devine, and he's going to read you... Oh, Oh, the the places places. you'll go. Let's give him a hand. I read this to my little girl a lot, and the main reason is because it's about growing up and doing what you want to do when you grow up, okay? What's your name, honey? You don't have one? No? No name? No? Your name's Drew. Drew, what do you want to be when you grow up? A police officer. Good choice, pal. I dig it. That was what you were going to pick? Well, everybody wants to be cops. That's great. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're up and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know. And you are the guy who decide where to go.